Hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Good. It's been a very good long day, but I am excited to um, come on here and talk with you today. Yeah, it's very exciting. New book. New conversations book. about to happen. I know, right? Okay, so let's just jump into it. What was your first impression? We read the first 30 pages of All You Could Ever Know, All You Can Ever Know by Nicole Chung. That's backwards. Mm -hmm. Don't don't look at it. No, 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 I can see. Wait, it's it's right ways for you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. It's backwards for me. <laughs> it's a great book. So far I love it. I love her writing style um and her telling her story and then she gets a little into her parent story too, which mm -hmm. is some important context. So far I've really loved it. What mm -hmm. about you? You enjoy rereading? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Whenever I first read this book, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is exactly some of the experiences that I had as a child, but I never really thought about it in such a nuanced way before. And so this is kind of like giving me like it was kind of giving me a way to measure and sort of just really look back at my childhood with, um, in a way that, um, yeah, with kind of like a meter to like kind of go back and just be like, okay, so my childhood wasn't, wasn't your average childhood, obviously, because I'm um, an Asian adoptee, but also like, it, there were some very common themes between my childhood and other Asian adoptees I just didn't know about because I was like the only one around me. So it's mm. nice to know that I wasn't alone in these experiences, but it's also very surreal to kind of go back and look at it and then to reassess my own childhood. So. Was there anything specific that stood out to you that you like to bring up? Um, <clears throat> the part where she talks about her first experiences with racism, that definitely hit, like, with kids, like, the very obvious ones, um, with anti-Asian racism, with, like, mocking the eyes, squinting, doing, like, fake, um, speaking fake language, um, it's definitely something that, like, the kids on the playground would do because they saw caricatures of Asian people on TV or they, I, I don't know where else they would have gotten that, you know, unless, you know, their parents were outwardly racist, but I don't think anyone like kind of goes into it thinking I'm going to raise my kid to be racist mm -hmm. so yeah it's, it seems more like the like the lack of training your kids to be able to be like empathetic and respectful mm -hmm. to people who are different mm -hmm. that lack of it automatically leads to racist yeah and other biases as well like mm -hmm. um some things are pure um like pure curiosity because kids learn how to explore and they learn to like they learn that uh, eventually that their world does not just revolve around them and their family and their small community that there is a greater world out there um with diversity and beautiful and rich people cultures um but like whenever you're really really young and you're just asking, oh, why doesn't so-and-so kid look like me? There's a way to explain that. And then there is the racist way to explain that. Right. So well, she, or, she as, brought that up about like, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, or as we know, it's not okay just to be 
not racist, we need to be anti-racist. So answering the question, why doesn't that kid look like me? What do you think would be the answer in the anti-racist category? Um, it feels like just recognizing and appreciate, appreciating that they have an, like they come from a different ethnicity, a different group and being like, and that's really great because we're better because there's diversity amongst us. We're better when we're able to get along and respect differences as opposed to being like, oh, you're not different. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're not different. Or like pointing that out in a negative way. Mm -hmm. What were you- What do you think? think? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah, what was that thought that you were gonna say before I just like went on and didn't shut up? <laughs> It's difficult because, like, if we were in person, I feel like we could feel mm -hmm. when somebody's, like, talking and when someone's not. But over Zoom, I can't feel that. Yeah, and there is a bit of a lag tonight um, mm -hmm. on my part. I think my internet's been acting very strange, but. Oh, no. I was just going to um, point out that she she got that question a lot when she did the show and tell family thing and people were wondering like why her parents didn't look like her mm -hmm. and i mean she said she didn't mind it you know as a kid she really loved explaining her family and like the differences and she knew she was adopted and she didn't mind that but i would completely understand somebody was like oh my gosh this is so annoying mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm sick of this yeah and like it must it must have definitely felt like isolating. Like I knew that I got tired of kids asking those questions on like, oh, who's your real, who's your real mom? Um, or like, how come your parents don't look like you? Or like China, where is that? Like, why weren't, like, why weren't you born in Texas? We're all born in Texas. And I was like, okay, well, not me. So I don't know definitely answering those questions could get old at some point like because kids moods also just change sometimes they're super super enthusiastic about it sometimes they're not sometimes they're super enthusiastic about Cheetos and then sometimes they are not yeah so um but and when she I brought also, up the bully mm -hmm, what were you saying <laughs> When she brought up the bully, it was that that person who um like introduced her to racial slurs was someone she knew, someone she carpooled with, someone whose family knew her family. It was just because they were mad that they took that out in a very racist way. Mm hmm. And like, I'm sure that like children with like testing their limits, testing like they are still not completely aware of social norms um, and things like that, um, or just basic empathy, they're still learning. So with kids, it's definitely, definitely really a hard concept to talk about race and to talk about like what is okay and what is not okay, but it's still a very necessary conversation, but doesn't mean that it's like, not a hard conversation to right yeah and just because it's hard doesn't mean it shouldn't be done exactly like it's like ripping a band-aid off for that mm -hmm. conversation because they're going to either hear it from you or they're going to hear it from wherever that kid got that racial slur you know yes and i find that the once you start talking about race and racism it's easier Mm -hmm. as you go along when you but that initial conversation of course mm -hmm. it's like extremely scary and yeah. you don't know what to say and your heart's beating but once you open up like you have that type of relationship with someone even a kid I think especially a kid then that opens the doors for a bunch of conversations in the future about racism it just it makes me think a lot about like how a ton of states right now and a ton of school boards are trying to ban critical race theory in being taught in classrooms and i'm just like our education system is so broken it's fine we're fine it's, 
it is crazy. Like nobody benefits from not talking about race and racism, especially white people. Like, so why, again, like trying to avoid an important conversation that's going to be uncomfortable, but you got to have it. Exactly. Exactly. And like some, some of those kids, like school might be the only exposure that they get to an anti-racist education. Mm -hmm. Like if they go back home to their communities, their families, and they don't have like some school, sometimes school is the most diversity you're going to get in your life. Mm -hmm. Like I think in like my own, in my own situation, like I didn't have another Asian in my school until I transferred into a, the larger public school. So I would have never had that exposure to other Asians, which I think was like very critical to my, um, to my own exploration, not only just within adoption, but like also like just kind of finding out like how I saw myself in terms of race and ethnicity and it just kind of was really big for like that identity formation piece especially during teenage years it's it's very critical right being able to be a part of a very diverse community especially when people who are like you are a part of that community. Yeah, mm -hmm. I completely agree. I got lucky in high school and went to a very diverse school. But before that, yeah, it was also not super diverse. Yeah. And then I also thought that um, kind of shifting gears, like the that first statement, um, whenever she, um, her parents were like, yeah, your birth parents wanted to give you a better life that kind of, it kind of like strikes me in the, okay, what do we find as, what do we define as a quote unquote better life? Mm -hmm. Like by what standard, whose standard are we using for that? Because like in a lot of adoption um, stories and a lot of adoptee cases, better means like wealthier, better can mean like, um, like more access to more resources. So like, it kind of goes into the adoption and the family preservation argument. Like, what is a better life? If you're have if you if access to resources is an issue, why not provide the community where that child is from with resources so that mm -hmm. adoption doesn't have to begin with family separation? Yeah. yeah. That's a, a good point. Of, yeah. It's definitely subjective what yeah. better means because that's like your family that you come from that person, like, uh, Like we already, like there are plenty of studies to go on to just talk about the trauma of family separation like mm -hmm. no matter what age like it is it is a trauma that um unfortunately like children have to endure if they are a part of the adoption system and so like if that if any trauma could be avoided obviously we're all going to be traumatized at some point in our lives we're all going to go through traumas but if certain traumas can be avoided like family separation by preservation programs um and avoiding that initial loss would that be quote unquote better um if you provide yeah. the resources to prevent that I feel like it would be better in like the actual sense of resources mm -hmm. but when you said better like to give them a better experience I automatically thought of like American dream spirit mm. experience they wanted you to have a better life and mm -hmm. so to me that automatically meant 
the big house, the nice jobs, the two and a half kids, the picket fence, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And I mean, the American dream is based on white people. Mm-hmm. So that's a hundred percent what I thought of uh, when you said better. Yeah. Like, for example, like my parents, uh, whenever they were in China adopting me, would they told me that people would come up to them, see them with me and call me lucky. Like people in China mm-hmm. would do that because um, little fun little Mandarin lesson of the little bit of Mandarin that I know, uh, the word for the U.S. is meguo, which is beautiful world. Um, so, so they call, they call the U S the beautiful world. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes me think that better is American as opposed to yeah other characteristics of a better life. Yeah. And like, I'm no, I'm no linguist, but I would love to like know where that that came from in modern Chinese Mm. yeah I'm no historian I'm no linguist but yeah um and it just kind of like goes to show like because in the context that we know um in trying to actively look at communities and systems and being anti-racist from an anti-racist point of view. We know that the US, the American dream is based on the is based on the white heteronormative like American dream. So I guess what like what I'm trying to get at is like kids that are adopted into like other families, the idea in there, there's this, there's this facade, facade? Mm -hmm. There's this facade about the better life, you know, when that's not always the case. Yeah. It's interesting because like America is the country of dreams and we're actually like close to DC. And so we did a little touristy things today. And one of them was talking about how America should be a symbol of freedom. But the reality is not that. So the fact that when people, when countries, people of other countries look at America and think of like opportunity and freedom and well, and to think about like being an American, what my experience has been, what a lot of experiences of Americans have been, it's just, it's crazy that the dream or facade, I think facade was a good one, is so contrary to the reality. Yeah, I completely agree. Oh my goodness. And so like, and the idea the whole concept of adoption in and of itself, like it's hard to say that as an adoptee because it makes, I feel like it makes me sound like I am Mm. anti-adoption versus me being pro family preservation. Like, I don't think that it's strictly um, one or the other. I think you can be, I think you can be, Um, both in support of family preservation, um, Mm -hmm. but also not view adoption as completely, completely negative, because sometimes it is necessary, in my opinion. Um, But that just kind of goes into really, really complex scenarios, and um, and everyone's story is different, and so, like, I think adoption as a whole system going under the idea of a quote unquote better life is very problematic. Yeah. And Nicole goes into that when she's talking about 
uh, advising a couple because mm-hmm. they wanted to adopt. And she was like, they were asked, was it a good, it was a specific question. Was it a good experience or like, would you recommend adoption? And like, at that time she was like, oh, I don't want to seem ungrateful or I don't want to seem like I didn't come from a loving family none of that was true but so at that point she was like oh yeah totally it's it's good but then she said I don't see I don't point out adoption as good or bad anymore and I thought that was really I mean I definitely got from that because it's more complex than yeah it's good or no it's bad yeah yeah I think it's really great that she kind of just goes further into that um And that like, there are so many, there's so much adoption literature that's not focused on the adoptee. That's very much focused on um, the adopter's point of view. So I love, I love, love, love this book Um, just because this is like the first time I've ever read about an adoption from the adoptee's point of view Um, whenever I first found it. I have no idea how I found this book, actually. Not going to lie. I want to say it was like a BuzzFeed article. (laughs) Ooh, okay. I don't know, or some sort of newsletter, but I, um, I don't know how this book came across my desk, but I'm very glad it did. Yeah, and we're only like three parts in, and I'm, I'm glad it came into your lap, too. I know, right? I think, I think it's also worth saying that um, and acknowledging that most, like statistically speaking, like most um, children that are in foster care and adoption situations are black and brown children domestically in the U.S., um, and that many, I want to say there's a disproportionate amount of adoptive parents that are white to black and brown children. And so I just also Mm. wanted to acknowledge that because that also has to do with, um, with a very racist society that we live in and trying to combat that as well and the disparity between those two yeah it's definitely a hard topic to acknowledge because that like bleeds into like the policing system here in america the um the child welfare system in in the u.s like it it's all very interconnected and it, um, public health, um, public health, um, substance abuse, like all, all of it just kind of goes together in this giant rubber band ball almost of issues because it's all interwoven. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you go, you go. It definitely remind like takes me back to a better life because mm-hmm. like American history has made it very clear that these people should be parents and these people are deserving of rights and these people are good and then these people are bad. And like you said, it goes into policing and how we handle uh, criminal justice versus public health um, disparities. And, it, mm-hmm. it's all intermingled but definitely it took me back mm-hmm. to a better life and who determines what a better life is and yeah. who gets to live the better life or what the better life is comprised of yeah like historically speaking there would be like indigenous and um indigenous children and immigrant children that were taken from their parents um, to go live a better life. Um, so if you look up orphan trains on (laughs) Wikipedia, it's, it's a very sad story, but they would see overcrowded cities and see children not being taken care of. And so they would take those kids and like ship them out West 
um, to go live on farms to be provided a quote unquote better life. So that's that's kind of how the American foster care system kind of got started. So that's not great. And in my, yeah, and it reminded me of um, the Christian values as well. Mm. So like to serve, uh, to be a representative of God on earth mm -hmm. and white and that goes right into white saviorism and western saviorism as well but mm -hmm. specifically right here i feel like it's more white saviorism yeah and that that leads right into it man like i i have a feeling i would know what kendi would say about the american adoption system but I wonder what Kendi would say, like, I wonder how Kendi would read this book, honestly. I would, I would love to pick Kendi's brain about it. Like, yeah. Yeah, because I feel like Kendi's brain is like the measuring stick that we use for every other book that we're going through forward. It I mean, he's got to. I, I'm sure he's already looked into the American adoption system and like all of the topics I feel we're about to encounter. He's already thought about it and talked mm -hmm. about it and we just haven't encountered it yet. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Ah, have you listened to his podcast yet? No. Have you? Mm-mm. I have a flight that I'm going, I'm, I have a flight day after, no, I have a flight that I'm getting on, on Thursday, so I will be listening to it then. There's two episodes out, I want to say. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. I cannot wait to hear him say all the incredible things that I have read. Oh my goodness. Like, I kind of wonder what his voice is like. Have you seen any videos of his lectures or anything? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see um, what his voice sounds like. I know. I imagine to be, I don't know. I never imagine voices correctly though. Cause like, even when I watch sports and I think, oh, this person's voice is probably like this. It's never what I think. Yeah. Okay. There are three episodes out. <gasps> Ooh. That's the entire flight for me. <laughs> How long are they? Uh, 45 minutes each. Okay. Oh my gosh. I cannot wait. That's going to be great. This is going to be good. I mean, like, it's just, hmm. I think that adoptive parents raising their children in an anti, in an anti-racist household, it's even, it has so much more complexities because they're adoptive parents. Like I was a part of a fishbowl discussion about racism with my own parents and my parents were like, quote unquote, we didn't know, we didn't know what to do basically. And I was like, well, that's, I do got it. I do have to kind of give it to y'all. Like gotta give it to you like you really were kind of jumping into unknown territory um and I feel like even in our childhoods like like parents didn't really talk about race unless it was like an outwardly racist act that like was witnessed I don't witnessed I don't think talking about racism as a system as a concept as um and just as an oppressive state of being, I don't think that approach was really brought up until maybe 2016. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking um, when you were talking about how this is the first book of, from the viewpoint of an adoptee, just like how grateful, I don't know when this book was written, just how grateful that we live in a town, a time now where we're hearing from all perspectives as opposed to just one 
And I, I think that dives right into what you were talking about too, because it's, it's a different time. I feel that we talk more about race now than like, even when I was a kid. Like I remember that episode of that. So Raven, uh, when it was very obvious and like the store manager that didn't hire Raven sorry spoiler alert the store manager was racist it came out in 2005 people okay like y'all can get over it um the store manager just straight up went I don't hire black people and I was like okay this is a children's show and it has to be overtly like racist and in order to talk and learn about it and to know that it's wrong but I also think that there could have been something else saying that like um, that I think media and TV shows are doing a bit better of a job bringing that into conversation, but like more of the subtle racism, like the microaggressions and the um, just the oppressive systems like um, and experiences within those systems. I mean, that's hard to write and I'm not a TV writer, but I feel like those are the kind of conversations that are kind of happening more nowadays that I still haven't really seen on a TV show. Yeah, I think uh, that instance you talk about with That's a Raven or even like before 2016, I feel feels about right. Like you said, it's it was okay this is how you talk about race in these like very big ways Mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, this is how racism is experienced every single day Mm -hmm. so unless something racist happened to you where Mm -hmm. it was very obvious and it was very disrespectful and it was like one of these like crazy things then like I don't even think we acknowledge the tiny ways in which like everyday racism played a role in our lives And I mean, for like the role that racism plays in adoption, that's a very like everyday just kind of chipping away. It's not like a giant like swing of a hammer. It's like a very slow weathering of um, it's kind of like, I guess, um, I guess it would be kind of like um, if it's not like a giant like hack with if you're cutting up chicken (laughs) and you're using a giant meat cleaver and you just like chop it all in one go it's not like that but it's like using one of the finer knives and just kind of like carving it and you get smaller precise that's that's not a good analogy I'm very tired today (laughs) no but I get what you mean and it's just that like over time especially because I mean I know Nicole talks about how like they didn't talk about race in her family Mm -hmm. and as a woman of color to not have someone to talk race about or someone to even like understand what you're going through that that would definitely chip away yeah after a certain point of time Ooh, I thought about I thought about a better analogy it's not um okay it's like, yeah, it's not like a giant, you getting hit in the face with a giant boulder. It's like someone just slowly putting rocks in your backpack as you're walking. And then mm. like, all of a sudden you realize your backpack's like really heavy. It's not like one giant boulder that you have to carry, but like a bunch of little rocks and just a bunch of small little everyday occurrences that gets, that gets heavy and it gets you tired and exhausted and like yeah that was a better one than the chicken it's it I think they were both great it's definitely weight that you didn't have to carry weight that like is not (laughs) yours to carry yeah yeah (sighs) well that (laughs) was a lot yeah I think it was a good intro to like talking about like racism in terms of like transracial and um, it wasn't her adoption wasn't a transnational adoption. It was a domestic adoption because the family had already been in the U.S. 
um, mm-hmm. when she was put up for adoption. So it was a domestic adoption, which um, international adoption is also its own kind of fun topic to go through because um, international adoptees also have like are also kind of caught in the crosshairs of international politics half of the time. Yeah. So, but yeah, we can talk about that later. Most of, I think we will. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, any final remarks on all you can ever know? Um. Can we talk about the social worker who worked Ooh. in between? Ooh. Ooh. Oh my gosh. I was like, I cannot believe this person's title was a social worker. Just for context, I mean, she def or the social worker definitely tried to talk the birth parents out of the adoption, which is not their job, like at all. And then what else did they do? They did something else, and I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, as two people with social work degrees. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I was mortified. It was like, why? Why are there social workers like this? It is not our job, especially now, I feel like mm. not being in the social work field, but just using that social work mentality to mm. essentially guide everything that I do. It is not our job to tell people what to do. Our job is to support them in what they decide. Oh my my gosh. Yeah. Uh, Mm -mm. And like we've discussed this several times about like social work having its own pitfalls. Mm -hmm. like social just because you're a social worker does not mean you're automatically anti-racist just because you're a social worker does not automatically mean that you are a good social worker (laughs) yes as as evidenced by the social worker that worked between these two families we graduated with we graduated with um there was a student in one of my international social work classes that said they're um their biggest dream was to go and open an orphanage. (sighs) We graduated with them, (laughs) Kara. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Mm -mm. That, yeah, so evidence again, not all social workers are what you want in a social worker. (laughs) It's wild, it's wild. Oh my god. Oh my god. Just just so we publicly acknowledge that that just, is not okay. Just so that's out there. Also, I forgot. Look at the shirt I'm wearing. <laughs> yes. Ooh, very nice. I got it from a rally. <laughs> really? Okay. For yep. all those who cannot see, it says stop Asian hate. Yep. I love um, it. Yeah. All righty, it is getting close to my bedtime. (laughs) I feel like we're getting later and later. (laughs) I know, I know. Hopefully, like, it'll, um, once I start this new job, it'll not be this late again. Yeah, it's also, like, partially on me and my unpredictable schedule. I will take my blame. I will take my blame, too. I talked to you about 30 minutes about plants before this. (laughs) <laughs> yes but that's important they are important. like we can't cut out plant time <laughs> well thank mm-hmm. you so much as always for embarking on this literary journey with me yeah thank you for suggesting this book I look forward to the future chapters I know right there's some interesting plot twists for sure that I'm excited for you to unpack with me Okay. But I will see you next week. Yes. As for tonight, have a great night. All right. Good night.
Yeah. Yeah.